It's really a pleasure to be here. The last time I uh, was at Reach was three years ago. Um, three years ago, probably this week or this month. And Facebook was a very different company then. Um, we had just launched Crucial Conversations probably six or seven months before the last Reach. Uh, and I came and spoke about what we were trying to build. Um, and so now, fast forward three years later, I'm gonna give you a little bit of demographics. Um, at the time that I spoke here last, I think we had about 2,000 employees globally. Um, I don't, our earnings releases today and they'll release the official number of employees that we have. It's over 10,000 now. Yeah. Um, as you can imagine, quintupling the size of a company like Facebook um, in, in three years, essentially, is no short order. Um, and one of the things that, we, that I talked about three years ago when I first came to Reach, um, and that I'm gonna continue talking about today, my thinking about Crucial and the role that it plays in a company has shifted over the years from how do I help people one-on-one -on -one or meet a group of 20 or 30, um, and the people that work with me at Facebook, how do we teach this class to help people master these skills, to really how do we build a company that maintains what Mark and a small group of people started in a dorm room 11 and a half years ago at scale. And when I came here and spoke a few years ago, we were talking about you know, one-off little conversations that people were having using our platform, because um, a lot of the quotes that Joseph said, I'm like, I'm pretty sure I've seen people post those things internally. Our problem wasn't getting people to speak up, it was to tone it down. Um, <laughs> so, as we've continued to evolve how we use Crucial and how we think about culture at Facebook, um, one of the things that became really apparent was if we wanted to build an organization that reflected the diversity of the people that use our product, we were gonna have to count, uh, ta tackle some really tough topics. Uh, a couple of other demographic bits of information. Uh, we have a, almost a billion and a half people using Facebook globally. Thank you. <laughs> Thank all of you, if you're on it, thank you for helping us get there. Um, and Instagram as well, WhatsApp. Um, billion and a half people, about 180 some million of them are here in the US. The vast majority of people that use Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp every day are not in America, they're elsewhere. So being an American-based company, we have people all over the world, but we're an American-based company that is trying to connect the world. And in order to do that, we really want an organization that reflects the diversity of the people that are using our product. So about a year and a half ago, we launched a program called Managing Bias at Facebook. Um, we started piloting it internally. We wanted to give an opportunity for people to talk about things that were really important, leveraging a lot of the skills that we teach in Crucial. Now, there's lots of things that companies think are hard to talk about. Politics, um, how many of you talk about politics at work? Probably not many of you. I'm like, I do. Uh, religion, civil rights, social justice, there's been a lot of stuff going on in the world. Um, and clearly on Facebook as a platform, we enable a lot of conversations that people have with their friends and their family, and, and now more and more with public figures about these things, sports. <laughs> We don't all like the same sports teams. We talk about that internally as well. Um, but talking about unconscious bias was one of the things that it's like, okay, if we're really gonna go there, if we're really gonna have a culture and be open is one of our company values. If we're really gonna do this in a way that matters, we have to be willing to talk about stuff that's incredibly sensitive to talk about. One of the things that we found, um, it, and many of you probably know Cheryl Sandberg, our COO, wrote a book called Lean In a couple of years ago. Um, and one of the things that she talked about in Lean In was the bias that women face in the workplace and how to overcome it. Um, and in working with the researchers from Lean In and from some of the schools that, uh, that had researchers that helped her uh, with the research on, from that book, one of the things that they found was really astounding to me, and that is that organizations that believe that they're meritocratic often have the worst outcomes when it comes to bias. Why? Why do you think that is? They think they're evolved, right? And tech, not the least of which, like we work in a really progressive company. We feel like we can talk about just about anything and yet there was ample evidence when you looked at organizations that typically you would assume are liberal or meritocratic that they tended to have the worst outcomes because they took, they took their eye off the ball and they stopped talking about it. 
So one of the things that we do at Facebook, we have an all hands twice a year. And one of the all hands, we talk about the product and kind of what we're doing and what's coming to kind of get people pumped about what we're building. And the other one is about culture. So imagine taking all 9,000 of our employees, which is about what we had at the last all hands um, last year, and spending an hour just talking about how we get stuff done. And one of the things that we talked about, that, that Cheryl talked about, was pursuant to a theme that she started right after I started at Facebook, and which is why we started teaching Crucial. Um, and that is that you have to continue to be willing to have hard conversations, because as Joseph said, the bigger the organization gets, the lag time between identifying a problem and talking about it gets bigger if you don't ruthlessly practice the skill. So Cheryl talked about that at our all hands. I don't know if you can see in the back, that's actually her with the Crucial Conversations banner behind her. Um, because we knew that if we, if we took our eye off the ball, if we told ourselves that eh, we're past this, that we weren't gonna make meaningful progress. Shortly after that, we uh, sat down and redesigned our managing bias program using a lot of the principles from Crucial, making it safe. How do we talk about stuff that's really tough? And so the class was born then. Um, now, one of the things that I love bragging about Facebook is having a really learning-focused culture. Cheryl didn't say, hey, learning and development HR team, go design a class on managing bias. Here's access to some researchers. It was me, Cheryl, Lori, the head of our people team in a conference room, and we designed the class together, which is amazing. This was the output of it. And by the way, the timing is amazing. We released it to the public yesterday. So I know, I'm excited. Um, so I'll, I'll have information on how to access it. It was just incredibly, I'm like, thank you for timing the release of that with my talk. That was very considerate. Um, <laughs> Because continuing with that theme, we really believe truly that the only problems that you can't fix are the ones that you either don't know about or that you don't talk about. There's been a lot of talk in the public, in the press, about Silicon Valley's diversity problem, right? We desperately want, again, to reflect the world that we are trying to serve, but it's hard to do if, it's hardest to do in the best of circumstances, but if there are unconscious biases that are preventing you from either attracting or hiring and or keeping the best people, we're never gonna achieve that mission. So we look to the people at Project Implicit. If you've never heard of Project Implicit, it's a, a project that was born out of Harvard University. There's probably thousands of implicit associations tests that you can take now. Um, but we look to that to say, okay, let's give people an opportunity to say, it's not a matter of if I have biases, of course I do which in and of itself is an incredibly difficult admission for some people to make, right? Just like when you're teaching Crucial and they say, I don't tell stories. <laughs> really? I, when I teach Crucial, I walk in, when I start teaching the Master My Story session, I say, imagine that you just walked into the room. You don't know me, I don't know you. We're gonna spend a few days together in a class and the first thing I do is I look at this clicker and I physically throw it. And I say, what, what just happened? How would you put, post on Facebook about me? in a way that I couldn't see it, what I just did. And they immediately go into storytelling mode, right? Oh, you're crazy, you lost it, the thing's broken, you had a bad day. Nobody says you threw the clicker. So this was that moment in the class where it's like, let's not talk about whether or not you have implicit associations. It doesn't test for bias, it tests for associations. Let's just prove that you do so that we start by getting right into, okay, and what are we gonna do about it? And what are the impacts? So what we found is that our organization and the results that we that we uncovered and that people uncover by taking these tests really are not that different from the 14 plus million people that have taken these tests all around the world. It's hard to stand up in front of a group of people as we do when we teach the class and say, my mom went back to work when I was in kindergarten. I've worked in HR most of my career, including my reporting chain at Facebook, Lori, who's an amazing HR leader, Amy, my boss, Cheryl, Lori's boss. I work for some of the best women in business. And I took the implicit associations test, and what do you think my results were? I associate women with being at home and men being at work, strongly. Now, how does that work? Am I a bad person because of that? No. It's kind of like when people say, I've never clicked on a Facebook ad, I don't know how you might make any money. <laughs> Did you see it? <laughs> like, when you used to watch TV back in the 70s and 80s, when a Coke commercial, did you run up to the TV and touch it? <laughs> no, you saw it. Those implicit messages, right? That's Facebook money-making 101. We're advertising. 
It doesn't, you can't erase years and years and years of cultural conditioning from seeing movies and reading magazines. Every message that you get about the role of women or men in the world or the role of racial minorities in the world programs you in ways that in most cases you're unconscious about. Of the 11 million bits of information that we receive every moment, 40 of them are processed by our conscious. The rest is unconscious. If you are not aware of those biases and those connections, you can't do anything to control how they influence your behavior. 70% more readily associate men with women. This by the way, or men with women. <laughs> Maybe. 70% uh, more readily associate men with science and women, that was my van moment, Joseph. <laughs> um, this includes women. If you ask young women before they take a math or a science test to do nothing else but circle, are you a boy or a girl? If they become aware of their gender before they take a science test, they will do worse. Not worse than boys, worse than they themselves would do if you didn't ask them to identify their gender because what is the stereotype that men are science, women are arts. Um, implicit preferences for white people over black people, strong preferences for able-bodied people over the disabled. Again, these are, not, these are not biases of horrible, terrible people who wake up in the morning saying, how can I hold women, underrepresented minorities, or anybody, frankly, that's different than me down? So, what do we do with this? In the class, one of the things that we really encourage people to do, taking these results and the experience of the class is to live up to this principle. I have found this to be exceptionally true. Oftentimes, the most difficult, crucial conversations you have to have are the ones that you have with yourself. It's really hard to get up in front of a room full of people, coworkers, and a room full of hundreds of people here and say, my unconscious association is for women to be at home. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that I am not gonna hire women, I'm not gonna promote them. Two of them are sitting here, which makes me really happy. Um, it means that I need to be aware of it if I'm going to have any hope whatsoever of holding myself accountable to the standard that I want my behavior to represent. The other thing that we found is that when you talk about stereotypes, it's really uncomfortable. Maxine Williams, who's the global head of diversity at Facebook and who is the person that I co-taught the classes that we just released yesterday on film, has a great way of talking about stereotypes, kind of the way that, we, that you guys talk about stories. Um, the problem with stereotypes isn't that they're untrue, it's that they're almost always incomplete. And we all have them. J there's a great quote from Jesse Jackson that we talk about in the class where he's talking about walking down a street late at night and hearing footsteps and thinking, oh God, I'm gonna get mugged. And then turning around and saying, oh, thank God, it's a white person. It's a really powerful thing for somebody like Jesse Jackson to say, and yet it reinforces what we know that we all have these stereotypes, even people that have that stereotype about people who share the same characteristic that they themselves are negatively stereotyping in other people. So this is heavy. This is heavy stuff to sit in front of a room full of people and talk about. But one of the things that we found from doing this is that it's not to fix bias. That is a very long-term goal. It is to create an environment where we can talk about it openly and honestly. Because the other thing that we know for sure at Facebook, and I think this is true in any company, whether you admit it out loud or not, is that every conversation, every behavior is an opportunity to make your organization better or worse. I have the distinct privilege of every Monday afternoon, now I beam in from New York City, where I live now, to orientation every Monday, and I tell every new hire that starts at Facebook, everything that you have done thus far on your first day and everything that you're gonna do for the rest of the time that you work here is either gonna make Facebook a better or a worse place than it was when you got your badge this morning. Those are what the stakes are. So when we talk about the importance of doing something like crucial, to me it's just a core responsibility. You have to be willing to have those conversations. The stuff that Joseph pointed out that people were holding in a, I can't imagine how harmful that must have been to them individually, but I can't imagine how toxic that must have been for an organization to have all, imagine all of us, if everybody just in this room, if we were a company, all had a conversation with somebody that we were holding, how toxic that would be at scale. And when you're quintupling the size of a company in the span of three years, you're gonna have some people clash. It's just part of, part of the business. So what are we trying to do with this program? And I'm, again, I'm really excited that we're, we finally released it to the public so that you guys can hopefully take it, iterate it, make it your own. 
Um, the, goal, the goals are, as Cheryl says, simple to say and really hard to do. The first was to surface it so that we could talk about it. Cheryl and I uh, had the opportunity to co-teach it several times. The first time that we co-taught it was actually to Mark and all of his direct reports. 90 plus percent of our VPs and directors have gone through the class since we launched it broadly in January. About half of our 11,000 employees have taken it since we launched it. This is a big push and a big priority for us. The second piece is identifying its impact. I, I mean, I could go on for hours about the impact that unconscious bias has on behavior and outcomes. The stories, unfortunately, the research that we share isn't from the 50s, it's from today. If your name is Jose, you wanna drop that S because you're gonna get three times the number of callbacks for interviews if you're Joe. If you are, uh, we have one study where there's an attorney in a law firm, fictitious study of two papers that attorneys wrote. One of them, the name sounded black, one of them, the name sounded white. The white sounding name, the paper, even though they were the same, both riddled with mistakes, 4.1 score versus like a 3.2 if they thought the person was black. If they thought the person was white, the qualitative comments changed. Oh, this guy's got a lot of potential, he'll be fine. They thought he was black. I can't believe this guy got into NYU Law School. Now your reactions are very similar to the reactions that people have when we teach the class. Oh, that's terrible. The people that say these things aren't bad people. They don't wake up in the morning saying, how can I show a very strong preference for a white applicant over a black applicant? Years of programming, years of storytelling, years of responding to stories as facts is one of the things that creates these biases. Identifying the impact is really important to talk about. The impact is visible, and especially in tech companies, when you look at the diversity makeup of, of our employees. The final piece is to counteract it. This is where crucial really comes into play. I tell people when I teach the class, you cannot leave and just say, that's a bias. You have a bias. I, I learned about it in class, you're biased. That's not gonna make anybody be like, you know what, you're right. Let's sit down and have a meaningful conversation about it without me wanting to rip your face off. <laughs> Being able to talk about it, counteract it, is usually small things that make big differences. If you're an interrupt-driven culture, women are significantly less likely to contribute. If people yell and scream at each other at work, they just won't contribute, period. We know this. Yet if you know differently, you can do differently. And by talking about what biases are, very specifically talking about the impact that they have, we have found that we are more able to counteract it. And it's a journey that we're just starting, but we're incredibly committed to. There are a couple of things that I want you to consider if building an organization that not only uses everything that you teach in Crucial, but applies it very specifically to a very real problem that companies everywhere face. By all means, go take a visit to the Project Implicit website. It's implicit.harvard.edu. You can take any of thousands of implicit associations tests. The gender work is probably one of the most popular. There's race tests, there's all kinds of different tests. The other thing that I would highly recommend is this book, Blind Spots, The Hidden Biases of Good People. I love this book for two reasons. One, because of the subtitle. Like I said, you have to be willing to accept the, the duality of being a good person that also has biases that could potentially harm people. Those are two resources. The other thing that I wanna highly encourage you to do is not lose sight of the fact that being a learning organization is what makes this possible for us. Having a COO that will sit down and design a class is unmatched in my career. Certainly one that would co-teach it with me. This, so Mark does Q and A's every once in a while on his Facebook page. Um, I don't know if I did a Q and A, definitely would not get a question from Stephen Hawking. Um, but he did. And he said, which of the big questions in science would you like to know the answer to and why? And the best, best part of working at Facebook, and I hope for all of you that you're able to c cultivate this in your senior leaders, is Mark's comment, how does learning work and how can we empower humans to learn a million times more? Um, we have a long way to go. Uh, nothing that I'm talking about today is meant to insinuate that we're perfect or that we've mastered it. Um, but it is because of the work that we've done with the folks from Vital Smarts and with Crucial um, and the environment that we have really focused on building over the last several years that we're able to do this at all. And I'm really, really happy that we're able to share it with the rest of you. So check it out. Um, if there's anything that I or Frankie and Mike, raise your hands. 
and Mike, other Mike, where's Megan? Megan's right next to him. So my whole team is here from Facebook. We're really excited we're doing a breakout after this. If there's anything that we can do to help you make something like this a reality in your organizations, it is not more work for us, it's why we're here. Thanks.